licensee with the State Department of Agriculture and the Dairy Nutrient Management Program, and many of you from dairies uh, know me. Uh, I've been here just under five years now. And I'm going to build off of what Erica talked about um, with the routine kind of sampling that the county has primarily been doing and focus a little bit on our sampling, which is really geared toward identifying sources. Um, and so it's in some ways the exact opposite of what Erica talked about. We are trying to sample in the conditions that we think we're going to find discharges. Um, so we're not going out on a preset schedule every Monday to sample in a certain watershed. We're going out when it's raining. We're going out when it's thawing. Uh, in some cases, we're going out when it's dry because we think there's sources that are going to be better identified when it's actually dry out and not raining. Um, so we're trying to look at what are the environmental conditions that we think we can help find, identify, and ultimately correct sources out in the landscape. So two ways we do that. One is based off of the county or other sampling efforts. Um, where are they seeing high counts someplace? Are they seeing them on an ongoing basis? And if they are, or even a one-off time where they get a really high count in a place that we haven't been seeing high counts, we'll try to go out and do some sampling there and further upstream in the system to say, well, can we, can we narrow it down? Can we bracket it out by doing multiple sample points and locate uh, where a potential source or sources are in a watershed? Uh, or like I said, is it something that was only present because it was a really wet day that day, and so they got a runoff event two days later, we're out, things have uh, calmed down in terms of runoff, and we're no longer seeing a problem. We're trying to use it to, to, to understand what's going on. Uh, the, the other way we're using it is we're out in the field, and so we're using our, our eyes and seeing what we're what, what do we see out on the field? Um, we're using technology, our iPads, our iPhones, uh, tracking what we're seeing in terms of applications, and then prioritizing with our limited staff and time, where are we going to do follow-up sampling? So we see an application, and we already, we've looked at the forecast, we're like, oh, it's gonna be pretty wet. We're gonna, let's go and sample there, because we think it might be running off in the subsequent days. Uh, so we do that out on the roads. We do that when we're at other inspections. Uh, though we haven't done it recently, we do go up in the air and look from the air, see what we can see. Uh, and so we're looking for where are livestock? Are they in places that we think are a high risk? Where have we seen applications of liquids or solids? Um, what are the field conditions? Um, you as farmers obviously know your fields are very different at different times of the year. So we have some fields that you may be mid-September and it takes a little bit of rain and suddenly you start having runoff around them. We have other fields that that's not happening until November, December. Uh, conditions are different in different areas, so the risk is different. Uh, and then we're also stopping and just looking at the water in places. Does it look different? Something changed? Is it worth pulling a sample? Um, so in this case, here's the sample results that day. Remember the water quality standard for a single sample is 200. So this was a set of uh, samples pulled where there's a lot of uh, pretty poor water quality. And in this instance, uh, let's see, third, uh, three different discharges were identified. The, this was, by the way, all out in the Sumas watershed. We're, we're trying to be a little bit equal opportunity even though there's Definitely a big focus and priority in the Portage Bay watershed, but we're looking throughout throughout the county at sources. And in this case, we had a, a variety of different discharge points. We had uh, an application discharge in the blue uh, to a field that was too wet for the application. We had an application in orange where uh, there was an equipment failure that led to a runoff, and then we had in the green, uh, not an application, it was a facility-related discharge. So we know that we have discharges coming from different sources. <clears throat> this is the map showing uh, the, the lowlands of uh, the 
County. Uh, the pink or light purple dots here show the areas that so far this water season, since October 1st, where we've sampled. Uh, the yellow dots show places that we sampled last season. In many cases, there's a yellow dot from last year underneath the purple dot. Uh, but we're, we're spread out, sampling here and there and everywhere. And I'm going to uh, regale you with uh, talks about how we use this in a couple of different instances, how we're using source identification sampling. Obviously, these so these four areas that we're going to go to are just four four of the areas. There's been others, but these were four sort of case studies to show you what, what it is we're doing, how we're trying to use this program to uh, move us along to improve water quality. So this is just uh, off the Guide Meridian, south of the river, a uh, small ditch system called the LLPL ditch. Um, we, as part of the overall efforts in the county, sample here routinely as part of the county's routine sampling. We go out one day a month and collect samples at about a dozen sites. This is one of them. So we have a, a trend here for the last 13 months where the sample site is below 100 on average throughout the last year. This sample here, October 5th, uh, very low, lowest sample of the year. So really nice water quality. Uh, water at that point in the year in this ditch system, it was flowing throughout the summer months, um, unlike many of our waterways. Uh, so it still had some water flowing through it, but very little. And things, if you can recall back before all of this falls rain, things are still very dry. Um, from quarter inch so far that month, we've gotten less than two inches in September. Um, using our technology on October 11th, I documented um, two different things in these weeks after the sampling, both application in the area as well as um, livestock out on throughout pasture, including on bare, bare fields, harvested corn fields. Um, and knowing this area, I know that it will at some point in the fall be underwater. I mean, it's inevitable, it happens every year. I don't know how soon, but we're already looking now, six days later, that we're up to 2.8 inches for the month. On October 15, 14th, sample again, we've gotten a couple more inches of rain. Things are uh, flowing pretty good, and uh, we've gone from a uh, people call from count of seven to 40, uh, 4,600. Uh, so pretty, pretty poor water quality. Um, sample again, a little more rain. We're, water quality is yet worse, and so this, this is bumped up to a priority, so we're gonna be doing an investigation, trying to figure out what is the source? Is it what, what I saw with pasture management? Is there other sources? Um, this is what we're looking with by October 20th. It's, it's a pond out there. Uh, it's not just a ditch anymore, but this is right where we're sampling under Guy Meridian. We're collecting other samples in the area to understand is this something that we're seeing throughout the area uh, or is it limited to uh, this, this ditch system? Um, by the 24th, we're sampling upstream and downstream. The count's now finally dropping. Um, so after you know inches and inches of rain moving through this area, um, you know, I think we're coming to the close of runoff coming off of this pasture lands from the rainfall. Uh, and finally, in investigation, we're seeing that numbers are dropping, but you can still see an increase through the system. And out in field conditions, you still have very ready, present manure from, from pasture management in areas that have been underwater for several weeks. So very, very likely source for these high counts. One example of how we're using it. This is moving into, I mean, it's an enforcement case. Uh, an, another similar circumstance, not pasture management, but late season applications. This was an uh, area that we were seeing applications through the latter part of October. Uh, at this point, we're eight inches of rain for the month. Uh, very wet October, as you all know. This field at this point was not saturated, but it was getting to the point that it would be soon. Uh, at this point, the roadside ditch was still dry when they made this last application. Um, but within a week and another three inches of rain, there was flow coming off of 
of this field and through this ditch system. The application area that where they have applied is very saturated, uh, and we have very high counts in the going from just over 200 upstream at the beginning of this ditch to over 50,000 where this water is flowing off the field. Um, this indicates both that you know a week after application, a week or more, you can still be seeing really high counts coming off of a field. Uh, this is in, you know, not a lot of water. So when we're talking, and Eric is talking, you know, 52,000 in a fish trap creek would be in a really, really astronomical number. This is in a very little amount of water, but it's still a really high count. So as, as you move into a waterway with more flow, it would rapidly be diluted, but is strongly indicating runoff coming off the field. So that's November 2nd, by November 9th, um, we're still about water quality standards after a week of runoff off of this field, um, but the numbers have dropped back down, indicating sort of what we would maybe expect with this kind of runoff situation. You know, if you don't sample it in the right time frames, you're not going to see what kind of problem it may create. This is up in uh, the upper part of California Creek. Um, at the south end of the map is drainages that go into what's called the Brown Malloy area. It's one of the county's focus areas, one of the, where the county is sampling monthly, uh, as well as then some work that we've been doing in partnership with Ecology, looking both at dairy and non-dairy sources in the, the more northern part of these drainages that head into California Creek. This area is as much as Drayton Harper's been a significant success story and really seen improvements in the five years I've been here, um, these upper watersheds coming off of the Ferndale Clays are an area that we're still seeing some real problems. And it's not surprising. I mean, once these fields get saturated, the water throughout the season just flows off of these fields. I live in Ferndale. I'm very familiar with, with that. You know, even in my yard, I can watch the water. Um, but there's, these three circles are showing three different areas that, where there's been source identification efforts, including by us, but in the, the two on the bottom, the county has also been doing a lot of work. Um, we sometimes help them, um, and with many of you in the industry who give us access to go out on the fields and try to uh, help identify what our sources are. These are areas that the sources aren't necessarily easy or clear because um, we know uh, we have quite a bit of wildlife in this area, both uh, waterfowl seasonally on a lot of these fields. Um, we're just north of Ferndale. We have a fair bit of urban, semi-urban wildlife. I've watched herds 30 deer here just north of Ferndale. Uh, we have a lot of older residential development and old septic systems, so we have lots of potential sources. Uh, Working with dairies, we have old tile drain systems that were installed 30, 40, 50 years ago that are failing. So all kinds of things going on. I'm going to just walk quickly through the red circle. It was an area that the county, um, this is at the Alder Grove and Vista Road. The county has been seeing really high counts here repeatedly. So they asked if we could work with uh, upstream landowners and bracket it out. Um, we got the same kind of high counts downstream. It's maybe hard to see up in the corner, but in the thousands. And we sampled out, of, out in the field on a snowy day here in December. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't get nothing. We were, I was expecting to see very low counts upstream. We still got counts in the hundreds. It's one fifth of what we're seeing downstream. So strongly indicating that there's a source between these two sample points. We did it another round of sampling um, and the sample in the middle it's now 68 so it's well within the standard uh, we sampled further upstream and got a slightly elevated count just over 200 but still nowhere near what we're seeing downstream um, so we know that there's sources we think they're septic systems and county health is now working in this area with a few residences go and die test their systems and make sure we have functional septics. Because we, we think that indications are that that's the likely source here. 
Finally, and this is in the South Linden WID area, um, and the, the WID had been doing, has been doing sampling throughout Scott Ditch, including way up in the uppermost reaches of Scott Ditch, here at the edge of Everson. And they've been repeatedly seeing elevated counts, so the property owner granted access, and I went out and did a couple rounds of sampling to try and parse out a little bit more carefully what's going on there. So as we zoom in, First round of sampling here just a couple weeks ago. Uh, outfall going underneath the state route highway uh, was a was a non-detect, no bacteria. We almost never see that, or we get no bacteria in our sample. Um, low low numbers are common, uh, so we don't even have a way to do that. So we put in a one in the system. It's a non-detect. But then it's jumping 200 feet later into the thousands and even higher downstream from that. We did a second round of sampling, um, a little bit of bacteria at the upstream end, but going up to 21,000 downstream, and, and likewise, this is now in the hands of the health department, who has been out on the ground out there. And it's an interesting situation. It's in the city of Everson. These the residences there are supposed to be set up, hooked into the sewer system, but it's an area that was once all septic, um, and so, whether all those connections were plumbed properly when you go into a septic, subject to sewer system, um, this would indicate maybe not, and it's not even clear if it's the residences that are right there abutting the creek, or if it's something in the sewer system that may be to the south. So the health department will be working with the city of Everson to track this down. So we know through our sampling that we have you know, a variety of sources, and we're trying to work with our partners to identify them, dairy, non-dairy, um, urban, septic. Um, so that's a little bit about how we're doing our uh, source identification sample. I'm happy to get questions. So I got a question on your first example up there right off the guide. Yeah. I happen to notice that field when I drive. It's cornfield. Part and of it is, yeah. Yeah, and it floods. And so you, you talked about the increased <laughs> levels. But I also notice that every time I come by, I think that'd be a pretty nice place to be out duck hunting. And then I do see there's a duck blind out there, and I see a lot of ducks. How much, uh, certainly Erica Douglas talked about, you know, other sources. How much of that, so you mentioned that possibly being a violation. How much of that can you, can you determine, though, is caused by the wildlife that are out there versus maybe improper management by the landowner in putting manure or something on too late in the year? Sure. Um, it's, I'm not sure what the metaphor is to compare. Um, we know that wildlife has a contribution. Um, we've documented it with sampling in some instances, uh, including like in the Ferndale Hills I've sampled where I'm pretty confident there's no source other than wildlife. And we can get, I've seen counts in the thousands. I've sampled off some farmers' fields where it looks like manure has been applied because of what the waterfowl have done out in the field, and I've gotten counts in the single digits. Um, so we know that they have a they have a contribution. Um, it's frequently not something that we see is exceeding or greatly exceeding the standard, but we know it can. Um, and so, like in the instance of the fields there in the LLPL ditch. Um, the expectation is if it's wildlife related, we're going to see it on an ongoing basis because they're there throughout the winter season. They don't show up in October or right after the cows have come off and then leave in November, December. So when you have a series of samples where the longer you're getting from when you had livestock out on the field and the samples are getting cleaner and cleaner, um, even though the wildlife situation isn't changing, that would be a pretty good indication that your source was the livestock and not the wildlife. Uh, but I know we just sampled there earlier this week and that, that it's above the water quality standard. I don't know if that's because there's a, a preventable human source or if it's wildlife. It's not something where I saw that count and I'm like, oh, I have to go out there and solve it. Um, because ultimately we have to prioritize where we're spending our time. but. That's sort of that's as good as I can get. We I know in other areas, the Skagit County's done some more focused on beavers to try and figure out what kinds of contributions they can have. I mean, 
there's an acknowledgement and an interest that there is a, a background level from wildlife. We're pretty confident that if we solve the preventable human sources, we're going to be easily meeting our standards, certainly in the river and downstream from the shellfish beds, that we can we can persist find the contribution wildlife has and meet our standards. So do they ever go to the next extent if they think there could be a violation uh, to some kind of livestock producer and doing DNA testing on it to confirm that before a violation is? The hard part with DNA testing, and we don't, um, is that like with our wildlife, they're eating the same food, and if they're out in a field that has been more on it, um, how you parse out what your source is, the, the science isn't there to say, oh, well, this fraction of the fecal coliform coming from this field is coming from geese and ducks uh, and raccoons, and this portion is coming from cow livestock manure. Uh, we might get to that point, 